Hi everyone, my name is PC Timmy and you're welcome to another episode of Founders Connect. Here I have conversations with amazing entrepreneurs, operators and now VCs in the African tech ecosystem. Today I'm having a conversation with Bimi Aki Yemiju of Greenhouse Capital and Venture Garden Group. And I'm so excited because he's like an OG in finance and VC. I'm so excited to hear his story and I hope and I know that you're going to learn a lot. So make sure you stay and watch this video to the end. Also, maybe just share the link to somebody now and say, hey, I'm about to watch an amazing video and come and join me in it. So let's get into it. Welcome to my YouTube channel. I'm PC Timmy, a change maker, professional, and creative who is passionate about growing people and growing businesses. Like, comment, subscribe to my channel, and please always share my videos. It promises to always be impactful and insightful. Hi, Bobby. Hi, Peace. How are you? I'm very well. I'm very excited. I'm very honored to actually sit with you and learn about you. So I am honored. I mean, <laughs> your energy is just like uh, off the roof and uh, privileged, you know, to be here. And by the way, I'm not a VC. Okay, I'm so how would VC. you describe yourself? I, I, you know, when they talk about VC, they talk about all the people in all the suits and oh, the but ties. But you're in the suits? Well, you know, <laughs> but I have my black shirt and, you know, I, I have my um, tennis Sneakers. shoes and I'm not flying in from London staying in a hotel and, okay. you know I mean I think I, I consider myself a builder mm. and uh, I consider myself somebody who is then a partner to help builders to build okay so I support entrepreneurs that's what I do I'm not VC okay <laughs> so I will probably introduce him Bumi a builder and a supporter of entrepreneurs okay yes. amazing uh, so I usually like to start my interviews with as I, as I guess going into like the career just learn a bit about your background and where you're from so if you could just tell me a bit of like how you grew up, where you grew up, what was family like? Anything you can share? Sure, sure. I'll be happy to. I'll be happy to. Um, yeah, I was born in the U.S., born in Michigan because I have professors as parents um, and then moved back to Nigeria and, and grew up on OAU campus, Ife. So Bafemi Aolo University campus. So um, yeah, growing up was just campus environment, but I would, I would say I was privileged. We were yeah. the first family to own a computer oh, wow. you know, in Ife. Maybe the first or the second, but that changed my life. So I could come home and, you know, essentially, you know, unpack the computer, break it, put it back together, learn how to code very, very early. And second thing that happened, so growing up um, in a university campus, you know, back then they used to code in COBOL and Fortran. And by the way, believe it or not, you code um, on paper. Right. right. So you code on paper, you write the code, and then you find time. Most people will go and find time in a lab I'll to type it, type it in and debug it and debug it. Anyway, nightmare. <laughs> but um, something interesting happened because I started coding, you know, when I was still in secondary school mm. and being university campus. And you know, a lot of students on your final year, you have a capstone, mm. you know, project that you have to do f to graduate. Well, in computer science, most of the students, they're looking for somebody to contract that to. So somebody that could help you write the code and help yeah. you debug it and then they pack it together. So, that I made a me. living doing it. That was me. So I was making money in my secondary school, and uh, I didn't need my parents' money. I was just in like, secondary school. in secondary school, I found freedom. Can you imagine not going to dad and mom for money? I don't, nobody tells me what to do because I was making my own money. That's how I found entrepreneurship, and it changed my life. That's amazing. What would you say is your favorite memory um, as a child? I think as a child, my favorite memory was probably just discovering that, you know, and then on the side, I will also do some typing for people. My favorite, favorite memory was just um, typing all of these, you know, and I was a very, very fast typewriter. On the manual typewriter that you go, <laughs> doo, 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 boom. Um, and then I'll help my father to type up all his, mm. you know, p reports, all these professors and everything. And then the friend to my dad started saying, hey, ah, can your son, you know, write my report for me and then I'll type it for them and they'll give me money. Uh -huh. Um, so I mean, you make money from Cody, you make money from typing. Absolutely, and it changed my life. That was my favorite memory and that's why entrepreneurship is in my bone, it's in my blood. Okay, so I mean, obviously you studied computer, computer engineering because computers changed your life. Um, what was it like just going to school, studying computer engineering, and how did you like get into the corporate world? Yeah, no, good, good question. So 
um, went to school for computer engineering. I moved back. There was all this strike mm. in Nigeria, ASU, and everything. So moved back to Michigan, where I was born, and um, you know studied computer engineering. My second week in in Michigan, I just looked in what they call the yellow pages, you know, in the U.S. And you just go page by page in the computer section, yeah. and I looked for anything that had to do with computers, and I would just go and visit them. <laughs> went to the first place, went to the second place, and essentially the third place happened to be Artemis. And I just walked in there, I said, guys, I know how to code. I showed them some of the, I think I built a library management system, you know, showed it to them, and they're like, hey, you know, Come on. In your second board. week. In my second week in the US. And then, of course, in parallel, went to apply you know, for school. And so I was doing both of them. But I really wasn't paying attention <laughs> in school, to be honest. I mean, you already had a job, so. Exactly, exactly. I had a job, was making money. Mm -hmm. It was more exciting. I was a little, maybe a little arrogant there. I almost felt like I don't need to go to school. What's the point? Right. So I really was only doing it for my dad. So what was your job then? So I was just writing code. We were building the early days of forensic analysis, testing software, yeah, incredible stuff. I don't know if you know, in the US, they had this thing called like, who's your daddy, <laughs> right? Where you're testing to see if the father is the father of the kid. Oh, okay, so, that if so like the, a DNA thing. DNA testing, yeah. and if, if, if our system says that it is, then the state government will automatically deduct from the payroll of the dad the child support fee and pay to the mother. Oh, it was incredible. That's nice. Does this still work like still that? It's still working today. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. And I know that from your LinkedIn that you spent 12 years at Atomy. So you like, you got into the US, said I was going to work here, and you spent 12 years. That's a long time. What was it like? Like, How did you move around the car ladder? Why did you stay there for so yeah. long? Very interesting story, actually. You know, So I just jumped in. I met you know, John and David. They're Americans, and they brought me into Artemis. You know, um, and I didn't really care about. And how the old pay. were you at that time? I was probably like twenty, I think. You know, around that time, um, and immediately I started working for them and going to school. Of course, it was just about value creation for me, mm. right? So going to school, going to class, showing, not showing up at many classes, <laughs> you know. Um, but fast forward, graduated. And then I was thinking about leaving to, you know, big, Something you know, yeah. Microsoft is kind of big companies. And they're like, hey, come and become a co-founder with us. And oh, I was wow. like, wow, this is a black guy, <laughs> you know, straight off the board. So not really, but, you know, I'd spent yeah. uh, about three years by then. Um, and really, the only black guy there. And these guys are saying, come and be a co-founder. Mm. I mean, so he ended up, I ended up actually owning 50% of the company, right? Wow. You know, over a, a period of time. But it really was about value creation. But it also was about John giving me a chance mm. uh, and also realizing that I was delivering value. And for me, my, my thing was just, I have to work harder than anybody else. I mm. don't know that I'll be smarter than anybody else. I don't know that I'll have links than anybody else. But if but I you. outwork everybody else, they will see the value, they will want me, and they will reward me properly. And mm. since then, it changed how I even see employees and staff. How so do you mean? My staff, you know, after that, um, when I move back to Africa, and if I hire people, I'll tell them, hey, you can be an owner in this company. Like, why not? Mm. I was. Like, I just walked in the door. I didn't know anybody. I became an owner. Mm. So the opportunity to give every employee the ability Stage. to become an yeah. owner, the ability to become an entrepreneur, became my DNA. And it basically became my life since then. Amazing. What would you say was your biggest lesson that you learned in that 12 years? I mean, going from I'm 20 years old, I can code to, or I'm actually a co-founder, and earning half of the company, like owning that, like, what was the biggest thing that you took away from that experience? I think the biggest lesson is probably that of resilience. Mm. Uh, I think my biggest lesson was do not die. <laughs> you know, don't die. Whatever you do, don't die. I mean, because, you know, in America, it's not like in Nigeria, in Kenya, like when the business is struggling, you don't make payroll and mm. you tell everybody that, hey, next month, let's hope, yeah. next month, let's hope. In America, there is no Most forgiveness. Good. Twice a month, the 16th of the month and the 31st of the month, the bank will just come and move the money and put it in the employee's account. <laughs> and that 
payment must not fail. Right. If it fails, you can go to jail. Like, so it's literally, and so when you're, and we were so close to mm. dying so many times. So we're like, hey, this is it. This is like, this payroll, we cannot meet it. There's no, and then each time, just like we learned resilience, each time mm. something happens, something happens, we find a way, sell one extra deal, but somehow we just never really bounced a check. We were so close so many times, and I just learned resilience. resilience. Amazing. When did you stop coding? Oh, good question. I probably stopped coding maybe about 10 years into Artemis, you know. Okay, about 10 so years even when Artemis. you became a co-founder and oh, vice yeah, president, yeah, I was still you coding. kept... It's just, it's, you know, once you love it, I mean, I mean, like, people like me, you are more of a coder, you're seen as a nerd, <laughs> you know, you like to be in a dark room just with your computer <laughs> instead of hanging out with people and everything. But then something else had changed my life, right? In Artemis, and it's like, hey, we're struggling, we don't have enough jobs. Yeah and we're gonna run out of payroll. And then one day I just realized that the person that wins in entrepreneurship is not necessarily the person that writes all the code. You actually have to go out and mm. sell a deal. It means that you can't, I can't say I'm a nerd, I'm an introvert. I have to actually learn how to relate with people, how to communicate, how to convince people to believe in my story, yeah. how to buy my product, how to buy my service. And that's when I have to kind of hack myself and say, hey, I have to learn how to lead. I have to learn how to manage people. I have to learn right. how to sell. Uh, I would say that also really changed the trajectory of, of my career. And what was that trajectory? Yeah. Yeah. What was that? What was it, the trajectory? The trajectory was just pretty much, you know, Artemis, and we built a company, you know, 50 people. We started another company called Enliven, doing B2B payment, supply chain finance. Oh, so you guys moved from forensic, which yeah. is very AI focused, yeah, yeah, to yeah. finance. Yes, yes, yes. That was a yes. big pivot. Yes, it was. But I think something... It was probably a little bit opportunistic, mm. but then something just told me that like, you need to be close to the money. If you're close <laughs> to the money, you are actually closer to success. And maybe it was one of my mentors that told me that. So um, that, was, mm, that was probably 2006. And so that was how I got into FinTech. It wasn't called FinTech there, there uh, then, even in America. And so we started doing B2B mm. invoicing, payments, purchase orders, integrations with ERP system, integrations with ACH, money moving, and so on and so forth. Um, then we started a third company called New Wave. So essentially, okay. yeah, started three companies in, in Michigan, had 100 employees. I was the only black guy. In the whole 100? In the whole 100, yeah. Why do? Good question. We were in the middle of Michigan, you know, Midwest, and there was just not, not that many black people around. Mm -hmm. And I was really trying to be honest. And then one day I just asked myself, I was like, um, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm going to Africa. I'm going to go start from scratch. I had like five or six co founders. I was like, you know, guys, you know, I'm, I'm done with this. Incremental innovation, incremental improvement in America is not mm. so exciting. I guess I could have gone to Silicon Valley. Was it a Silicon Valley, New York, or Africa? I chose mm. Africa. Ah, very nice. I have many questions about that, but let's go back to LTM. So you guys started three different companies. And I'm gonna ask you before about your biggest lesson. You said that it was resilient. But at the time when you started launching companies, I think you guys had pa gone past the, were trying to hustle and trying to meet payroll. It was a bit more comfortable. So as you open up new businesses in different verticals, what would you say were the challenges that really taught you something significant that you are using now mm. in building companies? Good question, good question. So why were we starting multiple companies? I think we were trying to discover scale. Mm. And so the question then becomes, you know, are you just in the right, in the wrong industry, in the wrong service that you're providing? So it was easy for us to go from zero to a million dollars in revenue, mm. right? It was easy for us to go from a million dollars in revenue to like mm, 10, 15, 20% profit. Mm. And we could do that all day long in company one, company two, company three. But something was going on where when you want to go from a million dollars to $5 million, mm. it was hard. The right. question became, do you need to go and raise capital? Nobody was giving out capital in Michigan, mm. for sure. Or two, do you take the profit and you reinvest and then you kind of gradually kind of scale it, right? right. And then how long is it going to take you to actually build a, I don't know, 50 million company, 100 million mm. company? So that was what I was always looking for. And it sort of led me to this kind of serial entrepreneur or even mm. parallel entrepreneur, if you call it that, because I didn't shut down the other one. Just, I just was running them in parallel, just looking to discover 
how to build a scalable business. What did I find? What I found was that there are three different types of businesses. There's a lifestyle business that you're just doing so that you can control your time, so you can make a living, and so you can go to work whenever you want. A coffee shop, a, you know, whatever, whatever yeah. a restaurant. Um, there's a kind of venture-backed, bleed scaling type of business that you're building. So when I was aspiring for a $50 million company, da, 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 I didn't know it then, but I was aspiring for a venture back company. Hmm. But I was not in a venture back, yeah, a venture backable environment. <laughs> yeah. um, and I'm not even sure that the all the ideas were venture back ideas. Mm. Right. Then there's a the third type of company, which is grow gradually, grow organically, build a sustainable, profitable business. And there will be bad times, there will be good times, but in the long run, you are growing mm -hmm. and you know you have a good life, right? But it's not gonna be a unicorn, right? Yeah. And it and doesn't need to be. Time. Is it so so I learned a lesson that you should pick the type of business you're trying to build mm -hmm. and follow that script. Hmm. That was the biggest lesson. Um, and so ultimately, it was so the of these three, pick yes. one. Pick, pick, yes. No, first, decide what you want for your life, mm -hmm. right? And so, if you decide that it's a venture-backed, high-growth company that you need, that you want to build, then pick that one. Go into the environment where you can get capital, mm. right? Hire that way, and then scale it up. Right, yep. right. So pick pick the business and business angle and just follow the script. Absolutely. Amazing. Okay, so now let's go to moving to Africa and choosing Africa. Sure. You say you got six co-founders. Now I'm curious, right? You're in Michigan, you're in this company, out of 100 people, you're the only black guy. How did you meet your co-founders and how did you guys decide that I want to start Venture Garden Group? Yeah. Um, so so the, the six founders actually were from the US companies, mm -hmm. right? So all the um, you know, Americans was in the three companies that I started in. Right. Yeah, yeah. So so I met them just again showing up. Yellow <laughs> yellow pages, look in the list, show up, and then I met these guys and they trusted me and it was an awesome experience from there. Now moving back to Africa was a little bit different because now I started first, you know, first started Venture Garden Group, and then I started sitting in Michigan, mm. trying to look for opportunities in Nigeria. Mm. Doesn't work, <laughs> fail. <laughs> uh, and then fast forward a little bit, I had this mentor, Professor Adelaja, um, you know, incredible professor, you know, very accomplished, you know, Nigerian, you know, the first dean in Rutgers, that's a black guy, moved to Michigan, was advising governors, uh, and he, um, you know, my dad met him when my dad came to visit Michigan, and then this guy rolls into my driveway, you know, um, in a Porsche, right? 911 <laughs> Carrera. And I was like, hey, who is this Nigerian black guy in mm -hmm. Michigan with a Porsche? I was like, I want to learn from him. You know, fast forward anyway, met him, taught me a lot of things, but then he introduced me to my co-founder. Mm. So I met Kumi. So Kumi was in New Jersey. Um, he was working for a, a, a pharmaceutical company, but he was also very involved in helping U.S. companies, airlines specifically, to move into Nigeria. Right. So he's like a BD guy. He's the outspoken kind of like you know happy-go-lucky, always happy kind of guy. And then I'm the nerd. You mm -hmm. know, I'm the tech guy. I'm the IP guy. I'm the one just thinking about you know what's the next yeah. thing to build. And so he just felt that. Both of us would make a good combination. Hmm. We both got on a call just to say, hey, hi, hey, yo, tell me a little bit about you, about me. Um, that call was supposed to be a 10 minute intro. It turned into like a three hour you know, conversation. <laughs> that call. That call. And we agreed, hey, let's just do a pilot. Let's go to Nigeria for like six weeks. Mm -hmm and see how it is, you know, building a business, all this fintech stuff that you're talking about that's now a venture scalable mm -hmm. business. Let's move it into an environment where we will be solving a deeper problem mm -hmm. and then we'll find capital. And he's like, hey, between, you know, his family and, you know, my family members, friends, that we'll, we'll be able to raise capital. Yeah. Um, it wasn't easy. <laughs> but we went to Nigeria for the pilot, six weeks, essentially turned into 10 years. <laughs> so, yeah, so the six-week pilot to go and build fintechs in Nigeria, um, this was around 2010, mm -hmm. yeah, 
turned into 10 years. So 2020 was when we pretty much got done saying, okay, yep, building is done. Venture Garden Group was born and um, yeah. Okay, so that's, that 10 years is it's a long time. And you guys came in a point where, I mean, the tech ecosystem in Nigeria was still very nascent. In Africa, it was still very nascent. And I mean, by 2010, which is like um, 2020, it was, I mean, companies were doing Blowing amazing. Up. Exactly. Yeah. So what was it really like starting at that time when, I mean, fintech was not, not even a thing yeah. at that time. Yeah. And what was it like? What, what would you say had was, be, was the key milestones in that 10 years? Like the ones that are like, I'm really proud that we moved back and we built this. And also like the major challenges. So. Wow. That's, <laughs> That's uh, what, <laughs> ten, like, what was it? Yeah. The biggest milestones and the yeah. biggest challenges. 10 years in Nigeria is probably like 30 years anywhere <laughs> else. Like in the jungle. Yeah. Yeah. And there's so many horror stories, so many stories of triumphs, ups and downs, incredible. I mean, I could go all day long. But um, I think starting in like that 2010 era, there was nothing. Uh, I think that was around the time where um, Konga, Jumia, mm. those were the startups. And after a while, Deal Day, those yeah. were the startups around that time. Iroko also came around that time. That's the f kind of first generation, yeah. or maybe let me call them second generation, because technically, first generation is like interswitch, system specs. Yeah. I mean, one wasn't even, you know, yeah, there then, yeah. But system specs, e transact, interswitch, <laughs> those were like the godfather. I'll call them the godfathers of fintech, right? Yeah. That's like generation. Generation one. So I'll say we were like generation two. Um, and between then and now, it's, I mean, it is probably, game It feels like five generations. It, it feels like five gen generations. And of course, we know what happened with Jumia, ups and downs, mm -hmm. ups and downs, changed, pivoted, da da da. Eventually they went IPO, so good outcome, but then incredible changes Konga as well incredible changes obviously Sim had an incredible business yeah. you know venture back that was the first time that we saw venture capital actually come mm. into Nigeria yeah it really was you know Sim it, was, it really was Jason with Iroko um, it really was you know Jumia and Rocket Internet that was the beginning of everything and we were part of it then but we took a different approach okay. because of the lessons from Michigan I was like, okay, should we run a lifestyle business? Mm. Should we run a blitz scaling venture back kind of company? Or should we run a sustainable business that can earn a profit, reinvest it, right. grow and scale? And we essentially chose the third. Hmm. Why? Um, I think we chose that number one because we didn't even know any other way to do it. We didn't know any <laughs> venture enough. person. Yeah. We don't have degrees from, you know, Harvard, MIT or whatever. Like the pedigree of a venture backed, mm. you know, we weren't I white, you yeah. know, we, I don't think we fit into that. And so we just said, oh, let's just do family and friends. And I met an incredible person that also changed our life. Um, um, and that's Mr. Cyril Odu. Yeah. Um, at the time, um, my brother-in-law who kind of gave us our seed money, right? introduced us to his boss's boss mm. um, who happened to be Mr. Odu the vice chairman for ExxonMobil so he was the highest ranking Nigerian in ExxonMobil in Nigeria also the CFO so the CFO of ExxonMobil comes we go there we say hey we're on a pilot trip to Nigeria to you know um, build fintech right uh, we didn't call it fintech then to build companies um, around payment processing we're not going to charge anybody anything up front Instead, we have this interesting business model where we're going to build out this system and this, and put some equipment on this, some hardware, some internet connectivity, and then all the payment processing flow mm. must go through us and we'll charge 2%. He's like, I like that. That's brilliant. And then he gave us our first $200,000 check. $200,000 at yes. that time? At that time, yep. And when he did, um, he gave it to us as a loan, actually, at first. Oh. So we said loan, we'll pay it back. Um, then like six or seven other people within ExxonMobil said, if our CFO uh, puts money there, there I'm going to put my money there. So I remember like that was literally almost like my LP. I would just go to ExxonMobil once a week, <laughs> just say hi. The security person knew me. Everybody knew me. You know, it was, it was incredible. And how much in total did you guys then raise? I think we probably raised about $500,000 then. Um, we structured everything as a loan mm. because we just felt like nobody knows equity, like mm. equity, like, so we sort of, but it was, it was interesting. I learned something incredible. 
which was this is what people are used to they understand how to do loans they didn't understand equity mm. so we decided to do it as a loan invest and then return the money back to them and then after that we're like hey if you want to bring it back in you can bring it back in but this time you can make it equity right. and we structure it as a convertible note that hey it's look, it's like debt because you can call it, but it's like equity, so you can convert it. And that basically changed our, our, our lives. How so? Because really, we, we hacked fundraising. Mm. Because when you go into a market where people are not making equity investment, you're either banging your head against it, or you make it look like what they're used to. And these people are used to in Nigeria, yeah. used to even investing in trading, mm -hmm. like buy and sell, or real estate. Buy, ship a car, sell it, make the profit. That's what people invest <laughs> in trading or real estate. Yeah. So this tech thing, nobody was gonna invest in it unless you made it look like mm. what they know. So in short, over the 10 years, I think one of the key things that I learned was you need people that believe in your dream. And mm. they're most likely gonna be like, family members or friends or family members. You have of to start course. with what you have yeah. at first, right? Yeah. Not strangers. Two, fundraising, you need capital no matter what. Mm. And depending on the kind of business you're trying to build, the best place to get your money is like family and friends, right? Prove the model, prove what you're trying to build. And that's what we did. We proved the model. We got this money, not a lot of money. We had an interesting business model. We were planning to build a sustainable business model that's profitable. It wasn't, you know, blitz scaling. <laughs> it wasn't, and that's the reason why we also, another lesson, lesson three. Yeah. Um, we decided to build a B2B business, mm. which meant that nobody knew us. <laughs> nobody knew us. Venture Garden, who is that? Yeah. That's, over the 10 year period, you still hear that. Yeah. Unless you go into the tech community, yeah. that's when they say, hey, we know Venture Garden, but why? We don't need anybody to know us mm. because we just had, maybe all through that 10 years, we had like 25 customers mm. across our businesses. It's B2B. But the lifetime value of one customer is like $5 million, mm. right? And we just found that that worked best for us. Um, B2B is profitable. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, B2B is profitable. You don't have to raise a lot of money. Um, and then stay alive, don't die. <laughs> <laughs> Most, importantly. Most importantly. So what, what would you say is the lesson there? Because you guys like to do B2B, but what can someone else who's trying to build a business in Africa take from that particular lesson? Yeah. At the time, and through that 10 year period, every startup that came to me, you can talk to them like Max.ng, with Tayo and Chinedu, uh, Rensource, you know, with Demi, you know, almost everybody, Helium Health, you know, Tito, yeah. Goke, you know, Demeji and Co. My advice was consistent, which was, this business idea is great, it's fantastic, it's awesome, but this retail business, I don't think it will work. <laughs> turn it into B2B. Right. So my universal advice so now. was always B2B. Okay. Now, 70% hmm. <laughs> of the time, I still encourage people to move to B2B first mm. before they go into retail. But is it every business idea that can be B2B though? I think most. Hmm. And the hack is go B2B to C. Mm. Right, and the reason for doing that is that it reduces the amount of burn that you need, amount of capital that you need. Now, if we move post 2020, where money is flooding into yes. the continent, it's four billion dollars that came into you know yeah. into Nigeria last year, incredible, right? I mean, just 2019, 2018, it was still like one billion, mm -hmm. one point something billion. So I think now that four billion is coming and more capital is coming, yeah, sure. If you can go and raise five million dollars that you're gonna use to <laughs> do you know top of the line marketing, below the line marketing, then sure. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a riskier business. I, I still bet on B2B. Okay, so you would most likely invest in a B2B company over a B2C company. Yeah, or a B2B2C company. If you tell me that you start with B2B and then you move to um, B2C or you have them running in parallel, I'm more likely to look at it. Makes That's sense. a hack. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. So actually, what you didn't answer, what would you say was the biggest milestones in 10 years of UDG? Yeah, so biggest milestones, I think number one is that we started about 10 companies in 10 years. 
Um, was that like almost every year? Almost every year. I'm <laughs> restless. I'm just restless. I'm just like, hey, there's a new problem. And Nigeria has so many problems. When you're in an environment where there's many problems, you're Lots like, hey, ideas. we got to fix it. We got to yeah. fix it. We got to fix it. So yeah. we're almost starting one company every year. Not all of them were successful, yeah. um, uh, which was another lesson. But I think milestones, about 10 companies in 10 years. In our milestones, we probably had about 1,000 people hmm. that went through VGG. Um, so we were, and we were when always. When you went through, you mean as a training? Um, no. Bit. like worked for us, Whoa. left, and we call it revolving door. Come, go, um, some people will go to a bigger company, some people will go to start their own business, and, and that's how we started investing. Mm. So the concept of investing in startups came out of incredible employees that worked for us, they want to go and start another company, and we invest in them. Um, so from a milestone standpoint, I would say, training a thousand people, and we were only not only, mostly hiring young people, mm. fresh people like that don't know much. They're just coming green, like Come you did green at our term is And you know, exactly, exactly, exactly. So I think training and grooming so many people is, is an incre incredible uh, milestone for us. Uh, in other milestones, we raised $20 million, <laughs> right? So during the journey, we now decide that, okay, building this sustainable, profitable business that you grow gradually, this is going to be a long journey. Mm. I'm going to get old, like gray hair <laughs> starting to come out and Nigeria will age you very, very fast. So we said, hey, let's go raise some capital. So in 2015, we raised $20 million from private equity company. So that was also an interesting milestone. And then um, what other milestone? I think then um, moving to make investments, mm. right, is also another milestone. So during the 10, towards the end of the 10 year journey, we had learned how to build businesses. We learned how incredibly hard it is to build a business yeah. um, and all the lessons we wanted to pass it along and so we started greenhouse capital um, uh, first as almost like an accelerator incubator where you're training entrepreneurs and then after a while we just took all the money we made over the years and just put it back as and fund. as funds into you know investing so in other would people. you say that vgg is, is sort of like done and now it's just the vc firm or what's the what's the synergy like between the both companies you got it absolutely so i feel like my journey in africa phase one is done um mm. that's 10 years COVID marked a good <laughs> milestone. You know, it actually allowed us to take a step back and say, hmm, what do I want in life? Yeah. And so I think, yeah, phase two is pretty much firstly, what we did in Nigeria that was so hard, can we go and do it in all the other countries across Africa and the mm. Middle East? Mm. Secondly, the money that we made, the successes we've had, the lessons we've learned, can we essentially translate it into builders across Africa and the Middle East? I mean, and that's so what now the next it's not just Africa anymore. That's yes. Another 10 years. Yeah. Okay, so what are the key challenges as a VC now, as a full time? I'm not just building companies now, I'm actively investing and just supporting entrepreneurs. Yeah. What has, how has it been different from your 22 years mm -hmm. as just an operator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, when is it 22 years? Yes. I feel old already. Well. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, how is it different? I will say that um, at first, we say we're not a VC, and that's the reason, that, and we call ourselves, we say what we do is capital plus. Mm. And what does that mean? It means that we feel like entrepreneurs, back then, what we needed the most wasn't like just the capital. What we needed was capital plus advice, capital plus somebody to cry to, you know, when your most important employee is telling you they're about to leave you, <laughs> you know, somebody to run to when you, are, you have co-founders fight and you need to resolve it, somebody to run to when you need to apply for a license from the central bank and this is going to take three years. So really, a lot of what we have realized is that what startups need, what founders need, is really more than capital mm -hmm. and so that's what we do now. And so, how has it been? I feel like because I'm just a friend to the founder, <laughs> I'm supporting the founder, I'm just like, hey, I want to make your dream mm -hmm. come, come true through capital through advice, through helping you with international expansion, it almost feels the same. The only right. difference is that 
I'm not the one doing the day doing to the day. day, to day. <laughs> I'm not the one with the sleepless night. I guess I do have sleepless nights sometimes. But not like that. So you don't lose my money, but um, but it's not like it was before. So for the most part, it's the same. I feel like I now have a bigger outlet mm. to problem solve. Mm. I can only create 10 companies, yeah. you know, in 10 years. I could only solve maybe six problems successfully mm. or seven problems the other ones failed. But how about the opportunity to take my capital and just back founders that are solving problems across 10 countries, you know, it's just incredible. So I enjoy it so much. That's amazing. How many companies have you guys funded so far? Oh, um, about 50. Oh, wow. In two yeah. years? Yeah. That's a well, lot. a little over two years okay. because at first we were we doing just, it informally. Yeah. Where we just say, hey, uh, yeah, that, that, yeah. Good job. You, you did a really good job. You're leaving this VGG. We're so unhappy, but you're such a great guy. Uh, you know, so yeah. here's, you know, $100,000. Right. So we did that a few times, kind of informally, before we actually started to call it a fund, mm. when we learned that, that what, what that's what <laughs> it's called. So I really like to say that we are learning the streets. Mm. I don't have an MBA degree. All I have is a bachelor's degree. And all I am yes, is a builder. I'm just a coder. And so, you know, um, this investing thing we kind of almost stumbled upon it but um for the most part it's just like being an entrepreneur because of our approach yeah i want to put it on the spot so just before we started the video you asked me what's my favorite founders connect video yeah what's your favorite startup that you funded so far oh, 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 oh. <laughs> you know what it's like when you have kids and, uh, and you ask hey, which one is your favorite kid that's one of the questions that you never answer um all of them. <laughs> <laughs> I love them all. Is there any 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 anyone that is sort of memorable for a specific reason? Maybe in the process to get into become and um, be on their cap table. Hmm. Memorable. Um. Several, so many of them. Helium Health, I think, was a very, very interesting story because here's this young guys. They're like, I don't. They must have been like 19 or 21 then, yeah. and they're like full of energy and those type of thing. And they're hey, they're trying to do health tech in Nigeria. And we say, man, this guy is just <laughs> tough. I've tried to build this business before in the yeah. U.S. I know all about it. Um, but I think it was very interesting, mostly because like. They sold me, when they told me that, hey, they've been trying to build this business, and the first thing they did when they came back to Nigeria was they went to every state mm. and literally went to observe the health, the hospitals there. I was like, okay, That's these guys yeah. you know, will, will, will invest in them. So I think that was kind of very, very, very memorable. Um, I think Short Gifts is another very memorable one because you know Sam had worked with me in the office of the CEO. We pushed him from Jumia, he was with VGG for for like five, six years, and he's like, hey, Bumi, I'm done, I'm tired. You know, I wanna go and start my own company. And I was so sad, like, he was like my guy. And I said, okay, no problem. Kumi and I sat down and we're like, okay, we'll give him the capital to start. And then with his, you know, his co-founders, um, they started Short Gifts. And what makes that story memorable for me is that Short Gifts was okay, did okay, but Short Gifts, then some of the staff of Short Gifts left to start Wallets.ng. Mm. And so Wallets was born. And I was like, oh, this is fantastic. Yeah. It's like, it's yeah. a chain. And then I planted a seed. I planted a seed. And then after a while, they had this crypto, crypto started. They had this, had this idea around doing a token. It became one of the most successful tokens, you know, you know um, in, in Africa. But it also wasn't successful. But then, one of their staff came up with this Busha idea, and then Busha came about. I was like, this is incredible. So I feel like, um, yeah, I feel like Short Gift was also a very, a very um, great story. But everything, Flutterwave is incredible. They're, you know, largest unicorn yeah. now. Rain Source Energy, that's doing solar energy is great. They turn, now they spun off Sabi. Um, off of it, Sabi is now like, you know, an incredible, you know, company, Max.ng, you know, Max just raised $33 million, yeah. you know, Migo Money, as it's, there's, there's so many, of all them. of them, I love them all. <laughs> That's amazing. In, in the last couple of years, I've just been in your career from that guy that went to Michigan and just started looking for, you know, where to work. What, if, is there anything that you would do differently if you had the chance to go back? Oh. What would I do differently? Um, hmm, that's a good question. What would I do differently? 
Yeah, maybe a few things. I mean, number one, I think coming back to um, Nigeria, we did some things right. Mm. So it was myself, and then Kumi became a partner, and then um, uh, my third partner, Demola, who I met back in Nigeria, because mm. uh, I did about one, one or two years in college yeah. in Nigeria, in Akure, in Futa. Um, and I met Demola then, and we were coding together. In fact, that's a story from another day, because we, we used to code for food. So coding <laughs> for food, that's all that really was. Anyway, interesting um, college story. But um, I think having co-founders that you all trust and believe in each other was very, very important. Um, but looking back now, I would say that um, if I wanted to build faster, Maybe I should have brought one of my American co-founders <laughs> with me because the truth of the matter is that there's still a role in one play on one side, you know, in Africa. Yeah. You know, you have the the white person on the team, it helps. Yeah. I would have done that differently. <laughs> I think ten years might have been five years. So it mm -hmm. would have been myself, Kumi. Um, who is business development, PR, and those type of things, you know, Demola, Coda, you know, exceptional risk manager, operations, execution. And I would have gotten my white co-founder that just, also helps us, you know, to spice things up yeah. in, in Africa. And I think we may have done 10 years in five years. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's probably the biggest one. Right. But you won't call that a mistake, right? I won't call it a mistake. It's just... It's a lesson. It's a, maybe something I would have done differently, not a mistake. Okay. The second one is when we raised capital, um, we raised capital from a PE firm, okay. a South African PE firm. And I think it was an incredible experience. We learned a lot. You know, these guys, those guys were very smart. But um, it, I, I won't call it a mistake, but if I had to change things, I would probably prefer to raise capital from like a Nigerian Mm. firm and I probably will not raise money from a PE mm. I'll raise money from a VC why why because, a Nigeria firm and why a VC yes thank you because first the PE business model is all about investing in a growing profitable company not taking risks mm. PE is not there to take risk with you P is there, it's not there to venture build with you. P is there to just help you scale the one thing you're doing already. Yeah. So I think VC money is what was required for the type of business we were building. Mm. So very big lesson learned there. The other part of that lesson is local context is very, very important. Mm. So I feel strongly that if somebody is investing in you, they should have a local team, right? They should have local empathy. They should like be there with you. Now, it's not practical for some fund. An American yeah. fund is not going to come and set up an yeah. office there, but somebody should be on the cap table in that round that to context. play that role. Yeah. yeah, so I feel like every single round that you raise as an African founder, there should be an African VC locally that is living there in your community with you on the cap table. That is how you get the support to scale you know, successfully. That's amazing. I'm just talking about the founders. What kind of founders do you typically invest Investing, because um, I mean, you mentioned um, Shaw Gift, and you say because he worked with you, and he was a guy, and then you talk about Goki and Tito um, and Dimeji, and it was really about just them doing the groundwork. Are there any other qualities aside being your guy, <laughs> <laughs> and just like being willing to do the hard groundwork um, that you look out for when you're investing in founders? Hmm. Yeah, and, and and it's not about being my guy, but it, it's really <laughs> just you know we're investing in random founders, but then we invest in founders like mm. that's what it's all about it's not about the business yeah. it's not about the business model it's mm. not about the product it's not about it's, it's about the founders company. like and that's the kind of firm we've built that's doing capital plus is to back you know founders that's that's what we do so um, the people first the people first now what do we look for in founders really i think it's like just maybe two things maybe three but the biggest one is do not die. Like <laughs> resilience, resilience, resilience. Because Africa will yeah. hack you. All the things that could go wrong will go wrong. The only question is, can you can stay you, alive? Yeah. Like 
that's it that's that's it so so i look for resilience i look for what kind of hardship have you gone through in your life right <laughs> i look for like how many times have you almost died maybe not literally <laughs> die but right. like you've almost lost it all and how did you come back what's your comeback story mm -hmm. what's your hustle story and what did you learn from there so i think that's one i think the second biggest one after resilience and grit will be humility mm -hmm. Look for humility, meaning humility to like learn, humility to unlearn, mm. because all those things that you feel like so strongly yeah. about will be proven wrong. Yeah. And the day they're proven wrong, are you going to pivot? Mm. Are you going to listen to the advice? Are you going to take it? Are you just going to stick to it and like have the blinders? And so I look for humility. The third one I'll say is ambition. Mm. Like how big is uh, your ambition? How, like, are you thinking like, or are you just, mm. so when I see those three things, like I'm done, like, let's go. <laughs> so resilience, ambition, and humility. Yeah. Amazing. Okay, so away from the business, back to you for a bit before we wrap up this video real quick. Um, I was time when you were answering a question and you mentioned that something you've learned for your mentor, but you didn't go back. But just when you said, I kind of recognized that you're probably one of those people and um, that, you know, take relationships very seriously and actually like see guardians and mentorship. So if you could just touch a bit more about maybe people that play like really important roles in your life. You've talked about the CFO ExoMobile, but are there other people that you actually learn from even now that I mean you're already successful? Yeah. Uh, still trying to be successful <laughs> by the way, you know. It's about how many unicorns, like it's all about, you know, so we're, we're still we're still a hustler. Either. Like yeah. we talked about earlier, we're we're still hustling here. So um I, I think that, that that point is very important. And I think one of the major, major, major lessons I learned, you know, in doing business in Africa is really um, relationships, mm. the value of relationships, and also the value of your reputation. Mm. Like, that, that, that is it. Relationships and reputation. Relationships and reputation. And I learned that from different people. Professor Adelaja, you know, always talked about that. Uh, Cyril Odu, um, bless his soul, he always, like, he was just, because his reputation, mm. anywhere we go, we say, oh, you know, Cyril Odu is on our board. And then, boom, everything changes. Mm. You know, everything changes. Um, Mr. Ernest A.B. is also, you know, former deputy governor of the Central Bank, you know, and he told us about, he told us about the glass ball, meaning the value of the relationships that you have at home, mm. your family, and the fact that, like, that ball, when it drops, it's gone. Scary, and yeah. so while you're hustling and those type of things, relationship is very, very important there. In Africa, if you're gonna do a deal, a B2B deal, you, you have people. to go to the yeah. um, you have to go to the burial ceremony <laughs> you have to, you have to, you know, of their of their mother in the village. You have to um, know their birthday. Yeah. You have to make sure you send a gift. When there's naming ceremony, you have to show up. <laughs> Otherwise, you ain't getting that deal. Yeah. You know. So I think you know the value of relationships is is, uh, is very very important. And then on top of everything. Right, like I said earlier, you start with your community yeah. of friends and family. And people who believe in you. Yes, friends. my brother-in-law Femi Ogumbi, um, he believed in me. He, I think, he was the first person that ever believed in me. Really, mm. he was the first person when I was still like my first year in college. You know, when I started, I did, like I said, I did a, a year or two in um, university in Nigeria. Then I think I snuck out of school, went to Lagos to just buy some computer parts that I was going to resell on <laughs> campus. You know, a story for another day and then it was too late so I had to stay at his house and I stay at his house I was telling him about like this massive dreams I want to build like a business in multiple countries you know da, 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 da. and for the first time he was like yeah you can do it well he's like you know so um, I think from then on I just value that relationship and make sure that I'm always just like of course ended up marrying his, his sister yes <laughs> ended up marrying his sister not because he gave me good advice <laughs> you know but um um, but yeah, so again, another story for another day. But um, relationships are important. Reputation is also important because it's a very low trust environment. Mm. Nobody trusts anybody. So everything you do, you have to say five years later, 
mm. if you're not there, what are they going to say about what you did? Mm. So it was very important to me. Every employee interaction, everybody I hired, everybody I even let go, any customer I interacted with, every project we won, even if when the project goes bad, if a project goes bad, do we abandon it and then, no, we will lose money on that project to make right. Yeah. And at the end of the day, fast forward 10 years later, there's almost no customer that you can go to that will speak ill of us. Mm -hmm. There's almost no employee that if you genuinely go and talk to them and say, hey, what was it like at yeah. VGG? Even if they were fired, even if they fired us, <laughs> you know, and left yeah. us, deep down, deep down, um, I don't think you'll find somebody that would genuinely say that, um, you know, this was a bad environment, they, they hurt me or they did something bad. Um, I don't think you'll find, you'll find that. It will be rare. And it's because relationships, relationships and, reputation. and reputation. That's amazing. Outside of being a builder and a supporter of builders, what do you do outside of work? Um, hmm. That's not something to think about, right? <laughs> <laughs> Are you always, you, you're always, you can't just be working all the time. So like, what do you do when you're not building or thinking about building a company when you're not having investor calls? Yeah, I work all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, I spend time with my kids, you know, my wife, my kids, I uh, love that. But really, there's pretty much not, no time for anything else, really, to be honest. Do you have any hobbies at all? Um, I try to play the piano a little bit. I, um, yeah, I play music a little bit. Um, I love Michigan State basketball. Okay. You know, that's my basketball team. <laughs> the year I graduated, we won the national championship, so it's a big deal. Uh, so I try to watch, you know, uh, Michigan State basketball games, but that's about it. I okay. build. I mean, Some you problem. build, that's it. That's okay. my hobby. That's, that's it. my hobby, really. I love it. You know, it's Final a hobby. question. Is there yes. anything that you have wanted me to ask you that I didn't, or something you have wanted to answer? Um, maybe what do I see in the future? What do you see in the future? <laughs> well, I think I see an exciting future for Africa tech. Mm. Um, and I think last year has just shown, yeah. it's like so a much snippet potential. into what it yeah. is. Um, I, so now our headquarters is in Dubai, in the UAE, okay. right? Um, story for another day, why did we choose UAE? But <laughs> you can quickly answer quick that real quick. It's an incredible place. Yeah. UAE went from nothing. 30 years mm. ago, zero, yeah. nothing, dysfunction, no water, nothing. Yeah. And then now, Dubai is like a cleaner New York, yeah. right? It's their place to be. Yeah. Um, they built, mm. they solve problems, they built. And there's so many lessons there, I think, that we have for Africa. Mm. And so if you think Dubai, if you think China, mm. and you now say, okay, Africa is where they were 30 years ago, mm. if we do the right things around Founders. I'm not even talking about government. Yeah. I'm not putting my faith in government. I'm not putting yeah. my faith in anything else. But if we have enough founders that end up making a hundred million dollar exit outcomes for their businesses, we will transform Africa mm. hands down and Africa will be even greater than Dubai. Amazing. So a lot of possibilities. A lot of possibilities. That's amazing. Thank you so much for answering all my You're questions. Welcome. It's been incredible just getting to know you and just learning about your very impressive career so far. Thank and you. I think the, I'm taking three hours from this, right? The resilience was something you have had a lot. Relationships and reputation. Uh, that's my, the lesson I'm taking. And I'm sure people who watch this video will take a lot more because it was like for every question you answered, you drop something there. So thank you so much. It's been a privilege speaking thank with you. Thank you for having me. I really you. enjoyed it. Enjoy your energy and ah, keep doing what you do love thank it. you so love much it. and thank you guys for watching this video to the end i'll see you in the next one please don't leave my channel without subscribing see ya peace out <laughs> <laughs> the peace out amazing thank you baby that's thank it you.